The structure of a team is typically represented by a series of three or four numbers, 4231, 343, 433, and so on. And while structure is defined by the organization of the players on the field, describing the structure of a team in a meaningful way requires more context. One important piece of context about a team structure is the influence of an individual player's actions. Replacing one player for another is never a straight swap, because even though actions can largely be instructed by the coach beforehand, there is always room for interpretation from the player. Whether instructed or interpreted, the actions of a player must be at the front of a coach's mind when trying to determine team structures. Allowing players to do what they please will lead to chaos, while over-constraining players will make the team too predictable and unable to find solutions. So coaches must find a way to provide solutions that are able to simplify problems for their team and also adaptable enough to not become too predictable for the opponent. Another important piece of context when discussing the structure of a team is the fact that the structure changes depending on the moment of the game. Therefore, it would make more sense to include the moment of the game when describing a team structure. When I say moment, I mean all of the different variables that affect the state of the game, like which team has the ball, what part of the field is the ball in, which phase of play is the team in, what's the score, how much time's left, and so on. All of those kinds of questions will have an effect on a team structure. The structure of a team trying to counterattack while losing by a goal with two minutes left will look much different than the structure of that same team if they were defending while leading. So when trying to discuss a team structure, the two biggest variables that need to be taken into account are the current state of the game and the interactions between individuals on the pitch. When comparing team structures, it makes sense to think about this on a spectrum from rigid to fluid. A rigid structure would mean that the coach has tightly defined the rules for all players for a specific context within the game. Let's take an example of a team that plays in a 4-3-3 formation. When building out of the back, a coach implementing a rigid structure might give instructions to the fullbacks that when the ball is on the opposite side of the field, they need to tuck in and form a back three with the center backs to give an option to circulate the ball quickly and to provide defensive cover in case of a turnover. However, when the ball is on their side of the field, they need to push forward down the wing beyond the central midfielder to provide width and give an option to progress the ball. These are very direct instructions that tell the fullback how to act in a given situation. On the other end of the spectrum, a fluid structure would mean that the coach only gives a loose definition of the roles for the players. Taking the same example of fullbacks building out in a 4-3-3, a coach implementing a more fluid structure might tell the fullbacks to force an overload on whichever line has possession of the ball. So if the ball is with the center backs in the back line, and the opposition has two pressing forwards, then one of the fullbacks will be needed to provide a 3-on-2 overload, while the other fullback can now push forward. This concept would apply to the midfield and forward lines as well, and the coach doesn't say where or how to make an overload, leaving the implementation up to the players. So how to spot the difference between teams using rigid and fluid structures? The first sign to look for in a team would be to observe the movements of the players off one another. If a player continually pops up in different positions all over the field, this is probably a fluid structure. However, some caution needs to be taken when using this approach because teams can have complicated movement patterns that are scripted ahead of time. So while the player may appear to be moving fluidly from one position to the next, the coach may have told the player exactly when to move based on the state of the game. One way to tell this apart from a fluid structure is to see if these movements happen consistently throughout the game. If the right fullback always overlaps the right winger when the winger tucks in to get the ball, that does not mean this is a fluid attacking system. Another sign to look for when deciphering between rigid and fluid structures is to see whether a team structure changes based on the state of the game. So if a team builds out of the back with the exact same players in the exact same shape no matter how the opposition is pressing, that is an example of a rigid structure. If a team only drops an extra man into the buildup to deal with the high press, then that can be a sign of a more fluid structure. Another thing to note is that no type of structure is inherently better than another. Not all of the best teams play in a fluid structure and not all of the worst teams play in a rigid structure. Both types come with advantages and disadvantages. Rigid structures allow teams the advantage of always knowing what fellow teammates are doing. This helps when playing against higher quality opposition as it allows players to focus on stopping the quality of the opponent instead of worrying about the positions of teammates. Rigid structures can also be used in order for teams to carry out more complex game plans. Pep Guardiola teams are a great example of teams that carry out extremely complex game plans through rigid instruction. Think of some of the most notable tactical innovations that are brought up when talking about Guardiola. False nines, inverted wingers, and inverted fullbacks were all tactical ideas executed with the intention of following the game plan. For example, there's an interview where Thierry Henry talks about not being allowed to move in from the wing until the ball was in the final third. 
Henri scored, but was then substituted at halftime because his goal came from going against a rigid structure defined by Guardiola. This type of rigid structure requires players with extreme soccer intelligence to be able to carry out all the complex instructions. Fluid structures, on the other hand, allow teams to adapt easier to the context of the game. When something is not working in a fluid structure, players are able to adjust and find a solution on their own. One example and a great counter to Guardiola is Jurgen Klopp. His Liverpool side clearly displays a more fluid structure. The forwards in his 4-3-3 are allowed to drop deep for the ball, but are also required to stretch the back line of the opposition vertically. In order to do both, they need to understand when they are needed in one position or the other. Fluid structures are difficult to teach to a team because there's no exact way to play, so it requires a large commitment to allowing players to solve problems on their own and as a team without much intervention. If a coach only gives basic guidance, they are allowing players to come up with multiple solutions for a problem, many of which will suit the strengths of the individual players. Fluid structures will require intelligent players who can solve problems, but most of all, it requires a team cohesion and understanding of one another to know what teammates are going to do so a player can base their own actions off of their teammates. Remember that it's highly unlikely a coach will explicitly state that they are using a rigid or fluid structure because it's more a style of instruction, less so an instruction itself. And while no team will use a completely rigid or completely fluid structure, describing a team structure will help to understand how a team operates because structure gives a functional definition of the spacing of players on a team in a given situation. The type of structure a coach implements for their team should be formed around the individual players along with the coach's personal philosophy but in the end, the player's execution is what will define a team's structure.